I'm going to actually, I have this little superstitious thing I do is that I wait till 1.30.59, so it's still on time, but it gives someone the extra 59 seconds to get into the room, um, which really means I start at 1.31, because um, there's always a few people that are scrambling to get in. Now, we're in, we're in cyberspace, not meat space, so that may not matter as much as it usually does, but uh, I'm just going to sort of stall a little bit until we get to 1.31 p.m., uh, and then this will be a 59-minute talk. <laughs> So um, while, while, while we're waiting, a quick, um, just, I, I don't know how to do the polls, but quick um, show of, I was gonna say show of hands, but that doesn't really work. Uh, how many people here have touched or used a graph database before? Or ha hasn't, you know, kn knows what they are, has used them, has played with them? What's the, what's the audience like? So just feel free to put it in the chat. Um, never, excellent, you're exactly the person I wanna talk to. Never really used them. Never, no experience. Excellent, excellent. Because uh, if you if you you've got uh, if you're a seasons uh, graph user, this is totally not the talk for you. This is an intro to graph uh, databases with fun theme, uh, and so that that's what I'm. A um, couple of false starts. Okay. Um, so yeah, my goal here is to make this a a D and D themed graph. Uh, Arthur, uh, yeah, the D and D will be a fun theme for you. Uh, you may uh, find some uh, flaws in my uh, talk. Um, I am not an expert on anything, right? So uh, one of the things that I try to do is I try to, uh, I get excited about a topic and I learn about it and then I talk about it and then I share what I've learned. So what I'm really doing here is, is sharing what I've learned. Uh, and so this introductory level stuff. Um, um, but, you know, if you haven't touched a graph database, it's useful. It's enough to get you started and then you can go down that path and go further. So what I try to do with my talks, is I try to, uh, get some excitement, build around a topic and get people started. And then they can continue on their journey from there. So uh, welcome to my talk, Dungeons, Dragons, and Graph Databases. And don't worry if you haven't played Dungeons and Dragons, uh, I don't go super deep in the Dungeons and Dragons stuff here. Um, and um, I run a game, I'm, you know, I play D&D. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So, um, oops, gotta go over here, there we go. So uh, my name is Guy Royce. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Redis Labs. And um, if uh, you are so inclined and are a Twitter user, I would sure appreciate a, uh, is uh, my screen, is that my screen there? It looks really weird. Does my screen look weird? My shared screen? Because uh, on my uh, mine, it looks like, yeah, what's going on? Okay, well, hang on. Let, let me try uh, uh, resharing my screen. There we go. That looks better. So, uh, um, yeah, that was that was odd. Hmm. Uh, high tech is die tech. Low tech is go tech. Right? Uh, we're doing high tech stuff today. Um, so this is me. Um, if you're on Twitter, I sure would appreciate a follow. Uh, I'm at Guy Royce. I value my I, I measure my value as and worth as a human being based on my number of Twitter followers. And so you could help my self esteem if you follow me. Uh, <laughs> I, I just post funny stuff and uh, occasional technical stuff and, and what I'm up to. So uh, all the code that I'm going to have here and these slides and everything and uh, the codes from all my other talks. Uh, yes, my beard does have its own Twitter account. <laughs> I did not create that. Someone else did. Um, it's been kind of quiet lately. Uh, I think the pandemic is affecting it. Uh, but you can go to github.com slash Guy Royce. All my code for all my projects are out there, all my slides, all that stuff. And if you want to go read my dated blog, you can go to guy.dev. Um, but since this is a D&D theme talk, I thought I needed a character sheet. And so this is my character sheet. And again, it's going janky. Um, I might have to. Okay, now it looks okay. Does it look good now? Okay. So uh, I'm going to try to do this without the preview slides. Um, so I, th I thought I needed my character sheet. Um, and so here, I'm Guy Royce. I'm a lawful, I'm a, a neutral good uh, dwarven bard. Bard seemed like the closest approximation to developer advocate. Uh, level five, because I've been doing this for about five years. Armor class 11, because I've got some uh, subcutaneous padding and uh, 32 hit points. 
Uh, my strength, dex, and con are kind of average. Uh, you know, I'm a little uh, hardier than people think, but I'm uh, not, I'm kind of slow. Uh, not very smart or wise, but uh, uh, apparently I talk real good. And so uh, you can expect the talk to be full of uh, sizzle and no steak. That, that's what I'm promising to deliver today. So, um, yeah, that's my character sheet. And and I've been an avid D&D &D player for years and years and years, longer than I've been writing code. Uh, I mean, since the early 80s. And... Um, you know, as a D and D player, you've got really two things you care about, right? You've got a problem. You got a problem you solve. You you want a power game, right? You want to level up. You want to get the gold. You want to get the experience. You can get to the next level. You want to get the magic items so that you can so you can slay more monsters and and do that uh, never ending grind of pushing your power level up by so that you can uh, tackle greater and greater challenges. And um, to do that, you have to go to the dungeon. That's where the treasures and the monsters are at. And these dungeons are full of rooms and you go through the rooms and you find the monsters and you defeat them. And then once you've defeated the monsters, you take their treasure. That's what adventurers do. But um, how do I optimize this problem, right? How do I min max it all the way? How do I become a super munchkin and find the perfect path through the dungeon that gets me to the, the right monsters or the right gold, depending on my goals? Um, how do I do that? Well, we could do it with a relational database. I mean, we're developers, right? Uh, we could uh, create a relational database uh, that has all the rooms and the monsters and the treasures and create those relationships and then query that relational database. Uh, and that'd be great for finding uh, which room has the most monsters and uh, which room has the best treasure and stuff like that. And uh, for listing these things out, but trying to find a path through the dungeon is a little harder with a relational database. So, um, We'll look at how to do this with a relational database, and we won't solve the full problem, but we're also going to look at how to do it with a graph database. And instead of having uh, tables uh, with, uh, you know, uh, keys, foreign keys and referential integrity, you've got uh, a, a bunch of nodes connected by lines, uh, connected by uh, edges or uh, relationships, and there's data associated with all these things. And we're going to model a dungeon using both these ways, and then we're going to query the dungeon, and we're going to see which one we like better. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, I'm going to say that I like graph better. So <laughs> uh, this is not Dungeons and Dragons and relational databases. This is Dungeons and Dragons and graph databases. So what's a graph database? That's probably the, the first big question. Well, I'm not going to answer it yet. I'm going to instead say, what's a graph? So uh, if you've got any uh, higher math than I do, then you may have run into graph theory. Uh, but uh, graph theory is this idea of a series of uh, vertices and edges, where you've got uh, vertices, which are sort of represent sort of nodes, uh, they're points, right? And the edges connect those points. And you know this 20-sided die that we have on screen here is a graph. It's got vertices, the points, and it's got edges. If you take the uh, vertice away, the edges disappear. All right, that makes sense if you took like this 20-sided die here and it collapsed you know, a point, then it would flatten, right? I just happen to have a giant 20-sided die handy. Um, and uh, But you can use these structures to represent more than just platonic solids, uh, like we're doing here. You can use them to represent all sorts of things. Um, the uh, and, and so these nodes and these edges, these nodes and these relationships, these nodes and these connections, I'll use those words interchangeably. Um, can be arranged, and there's a bunch of theory around how graph works, but they can range in a lot of ways. Uh, this is actually the most uninteresting graph of all. This is a null graph. It has no nodes, and therefore has no um, has no connections. Boring, right? So let's uh, add some nodes. Uh, this is a perfectly valid graph as well. It's full of nodes. There's no relationships, but that's allowed. Um, but we can connect these uh, nodes with relationships. We can connect these vertices with um, edges. And uh, here we've got some now. Now we have a slightly more interesting graph, uh, but not everything's connected to everything. And so when everything's not connected to everything like that, uh, these portions are referred to as being isolated. So node E is isolated from uh, all the other graphs, uh, parts of the graph. Uh, Nodes B and F are, while connected to each other, are isolated from the larger graph. And uh, as it turns out, the, the the big central graph here is also isolated from the other graphs. 
So these chunks are all isolated. So this is just terminology we can use to describe um, nodes and uh, portions of a graph. They're isolated. Uh, so let's go ahead and connect, connect up all the nodes because I don't want any isolated uh, uh, nodes or portions of my graph. And uh, another thing you can notice about this graph is that uh, it's now all connected. So this is a connected graph, which is the opposite of isolated, right? Um, I think graphs are most useful when they're fully connected, uh, especially if you're modeling a dungeon. Uh, you don't want, if you if you have one graph that's got two sex, sections of a dungeon that are isolated, um, then that you have two dungeons, right? It's also um, undirected. And uh, undirected has the word un, the word, the prefix un in front of it. And that suggests that, uh, that there might be a thing called a directed graph, and there is. It's actually easier to explain what a directed graph is than an undirected. A directed graph, oops, wrong way, has a, well, has directionality, right? It, uh, these relationships now have a direction. Node C uh, is related, has a connection to node A um, in that direction. Uh, undirected is a graph that has uh, connections that are bi-directional, non-directional. It, it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, they are not directed. There's no directionality. Whereas a directed graph, these these connections are direct are directional. And um, so the, the uh, graph databases are well. The one I'm going to show you is, uses directed graphs. And um, you can actually kind of go crazy with graph databases, right? So this is showing a single node connecting to a single node in all these cases, like A connects to B, B connects to C, C connects to A. Uh, but you can actually, um, there, there aren't any rules about how you can connect those. And I got a slide on that that I, I thought was coming next, but it isn't. Um, another thing we can talk about with, with graphs, uh, directed or otherwise, is we can talk about their degree. A node has a degree. So node A has a degree of three. That degree is the number of relationships it has coming into it or going out of it. Uh, in a directed graph. In an in a, in a undirected graph, it's just the number of relationships it has. And so node 3 has a degree of 3, node B has a degree of 3, uh, node C has a degree of 4. Um, it's just counting the number of relationships it has. Uh, you can also use out degree and in degree to describe uh, the number of relationships coming in and the number of relationships going out. So this is terminology that we use to talk about graph databases. And I mentioned there are, really aren't any rules, and there really aren't. Um, while uh, this graph here might be hard to render as a as a you know a geometric shape or a three dimensional shape, that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean it's any more or less a graph. Uh, nodes can connect to themselves. Uh, nodes uh, can have uh, bi-directional connections where C connects to A and A connects to C. You can have C connecting to A twice. Uh, it doesn't matter. You, there there really aren't any rules here. You can have as many and as, as convoluted of connections as you want. A graph database is where you take this graph and you lay data on top of it. So here we have uh, said the types of nodes that we have. We've added some rooms and some monsters and some treasure. Uh, we can add some data to that type. And so uh, the, uh, our first room in the top right there has an ID of one and it's the statue room. As everyone knows from a good dungeon experience, uh, the statue room is the first room you come into and it's got a statue in the middle that may or may not be animated and attack you. And then there are three corridors going off in different directions, right? So we our, our dungeon starts with a statue room. And, and, and in fact, it has three exits, so. Um, and then we can label uh, the relationships. So um, the room leads to another room. Uh, the room contains a monster, or the room contains treasure, or, or could, could contain an adventurer, right? Um, we, we can have more advanced uh, core, um, connections like uh, this room has a secret door to, as opposed to just has a corridor, it leads to. Um, lots and lots of capability here, but we're just laying data over top of that. And then using this, we have what is a pretty reasonable model of a dungeon, right? Uh, this looks like a dungeon. It, it, it lays over it nicely. You could, in some ways, overlay this onto a map of a dungeon and draw the connections and it would make sense. 
And never take out the jeweled eyes. Exactly, Brad. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I've talked a little bit, quite a bit about nodes and relationships already. Um, nodes uh, represent items, right? I tend to think of nodes in a graph database as being the nouns, right? Uh, they have labels uh, for their type, like they could be a room. Um, some graph databases will allow uh, rooms to have multiple labels or nodes to have multiple labels. So a thing could be both a room and a chamber, for example. Uh, and they can have uh, attributes, name value pairs. So this room has an ID and a name. Uh, of armory, uh, spelled with a U because we're playing D&D, &D, and so making it British makes it seem more D&D. &D. <laughs> um, and uh, nodes, like I mentioned earlier, in graphs can stand alone. You just put a node out there, and it can have its ID and its attributes and its label, and have fun. And you can just go query it. Um, relationships connect nodes. And um, they have a type, which is just like a label, but uh, they only have one type. Uh, they have a direction, because uh, Graph databases are usually uh, directional. And uh, they can have attributes as well, as well. I tend not to like to put attributes on the relationships because if I find that I'm needing to add attributes to them, that usually means it's a node. It would it'd work better as a node. Um, and I, I think of uh, the relationships as sort of the verbs. They're, they're like verbs, like this room leads to another room, right? Um, but you can, can't put attributes on them. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned with uh, you know, graphs earlier, if uh, a, a node is removed, then its uh, relationships are destroyed. They're, they go away as well. So this is sort of how nodes and relationships uh, uh, work in a graph database. And like I said, uh, you know, I think of them nouns and verbs, and so they make sentences, right? Uh, the room contains a monster. And you, know, you get room contains monster. Uh, all I've done is add some uh, articles and it turned into a sentence. Um, you could actually uh, flip this, right? The directionality is kind of arbitrary. It, it's just how you want to design it. Uh, and it doesn't really even impact the queries that much. Uh, you could say the monster is contained by a room. Um, however, um, I think that's clunky. It ends up being a voice in the passive, sen uh, passive sentence in the passive voice. And as my English teacher told me in school, uh, the passive voice is to be avoided. So there you have it. Yes, uh, I will take a pity, pity applause and laughter for that joke. Um, thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, so they read like sentences. So that's the theory, all right? We get enough theory now. Let's let's get down to the like the technical nitty gritty. Let's roll some dice and see how this thing actually works. So, because um, we've still got a problem, right? I still haven't figured out how to uh, go through the dungeon and uh, find all the monsters and find the gold in the, the best way possible. And so we're going to try this with relational databases. And we're going to try it with graph databases. And we're going to see uh, see how that goes. So we can sort of compare and contrast. So, um, and to do that, we're going to use uh, a couple languages, one that you are probably very familiar with. I'm assuming uh, that you've done relational database work and that you've touched, uh, you know, uh, SQL before. Uh, you know, SQL, select rows and columns from tables with joins. And here, this is sort of a select everything from uh, the, the dungeon tables. Uh, you select the, all the columns we care about from all the uh, tables we care about and join those tables together on forward keys, right? This is your basic SQL join. Uh, technically, this should probably be a left join in case uh, a room doesn't have a treasure or doesn't have a monster, but um, that's just annoying and we're not going to do that. So actually looking at my syntax, it should be a right join, um, but regardless. Um, and we're also going to use another language called Cypher. Cypher is a, a query language for uh, graph databases. Uh, it was created by uh, Neo4j and then re later released as a, um, uh, to the, the, the larger community. And so uh, I work for Redis Labs, and uh, we're using Redis Graph. We've got Redis Graph, and my demos will be in Redis Graph today, of course. But um, uh, it's the query language that we've adopted, and they've released it, so it can become a, become a standard sort of like uh, SQL. And uh, so Cypher here, we say match, and then we got this big pattern that uh, looks almost like ASCII art. And then we re return elements of that pattern. And the matching is actually the really cool and I, I think interesting part, and, and in some ways the beautiful part of graph queries. So if we uh, look here, uh, if we want to match a room containing a monster, we've got... Um, 
this guy right here, that is a, um, a node matcher, right? It matches a, a node with the label of room. The colon room means uh, room with that label. The R means assign it to the variable R. And you'll notice that it's got parentheses because nodes are round, right? And so it kind of looks like a node. Uh, on the right, uh, this matches a monster and assigns it to the variable M. Again, we got um, th these parentheses, it, it's node-esque, right? It, it, and it makes that uh, monster node look uh, kind of like a node. And then in the middle here, we have uh, the relationship. And here we're saying match uh, relationship contains uh, and assign it to C. And you'll notice on the far right of that contains, there's a little dash greater than. It's an arrow. It's drawing the line showing the room contains a monster, right? Um, and so it kind of looks like what it is. And so this is why I think it's, you know, that's why people say it's like a cross between ASCII art and a query language, because it kind of is. And I, it's got an elegance to it that I think is really cool. And immediately sucked me in as soon as I saw this. I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And oh, I, this is like databases around nouns instead of databases around tables. It's good stuff. So using Cypher and using SQL, we're going to create some rooms. We're going to do, I'm, I'm going to hit the four basic CRUD operations, right? Create, read, update, and delete. And we're going to do those for rooms. So assuming we have our tables already, uh, we've got a rooms table. It has an ID and a name. If we want to use SQL to populate that table, uh, it's just an insert statement, right? Insert into rooms the names of the columns you want to populate with the values for the columns that you named. So here we're inserting a uh, statue room with an ID of one. We've done this code a bajillion times. To do it in Cypher, it actually doesn't look that terribly different. Uh, we create a node, see the parentheses again, uh, of, with a label of room, and we assign that to the temporary working variable R. And then in the set command, we can say r.id equals the id, r.name equals the statue room, et cetera, et cetera, and just comma separate that for all the properties we want to set. And uh, if we had more, we could just go ahead and add them. Um, it's it's not there's no fixed columns on these these nodes. They're just attributes. They're just like a, like JSON objects in JavaScript. Uh, you, if I wanted to say r dots, you know, uh, height uh, height width and depth, we could add those. And other rooms might not have that, and that would be okay. But this is how we would do a create with um, uh, with Cypher. So pretty straightforward. Let's look at a read. So if we want to select from there, uh, this is uh, what everyone knows from SQL, uh, select ID and name from rooms where ID equals one. This is uh, like SQL 101, right? This is the first thing they teach you, select star from table. Select clue from users, uh, select, uh, select, uh, select star from users where clue greater than one. Uh-oh. Um, but to, to uh, read from a uh, graph database, you do the same match. You do a match. You say match R colon room, and that matches all rooms. Everything that matches that pattern, everything that's got a label of room, uh, gets assigned to R. And then we can filter them with a where clause, uh, just like we did in SQL. And so we only get the one with the ID of one, and then we return it. Now, if we took that where clause out of there and returned it, we would get just all the rooms. But we can also just go get one room. Uh, updating rooms. Um, that's a, a basic update statement. Update rooms, set the name equal to what we want, where the ID is what we want to update. Again, SQL, we've done this. Um, to do it with um, Cypher, you need to match the room, just like we did uh, before. Right, this is actually quite similar. We're matching the room to return it, right? But now we're matching the room where the ID is one, and then we're setting a property. So we're renaming the room to statue hall from uh, statue room. Um, and then we could set other things, and we could add things too. We could match that where it's at and add properties to it, add attributes. So it's a little more flexible than SQL uh, because we don't have a schema. But so far, it's not terribly different. It's it's a little it's a little different, but you know we're just manipulating nodes. Um, but it's not super super different. 
And then last but not least, uh, we'll have the delete. Uh, delete from rooms where ID equals one. Make sure you always have that where ID equals one or you're in trouble. Um, and, you'll, and then you'll find out if your disaster recovery process works or not. <laughs> in, um, in graph, again, we're doing a match with the where. This is a pattern you'll see all the time. Match these things, assign them to a variable, and then operate on that variable. So match a room where the ID is one, and then delete it. So makes sense so far. If you have any questions, of course, throw them in the chat, please. Um, hopefully this is a, a fairly clear. I did want to make a note on nodes. So I've been using this syntax where I say match r colon room where r.id equals one. And uh, that's, I, th I think, in some ways more readable. However, there is another syntax you can use to do this. And in some ways, this reinforces the ASCII art aspect of it, or the ASCII aspect. And that's where you can uh, use curly braces and do uh, uh, name colon value, common name colon value, common name colon value. And it will match rooms where the ID is one. And, and so we can do something similar here. And so this is another way of matching. And this is another, actually, it's just another way of referencing nodes where you can say, uh, you know, where it has the attributes. It's worth noting, actually, that the, uh, the colon room part is optional. You don't actually have to match a particular label. You could match just on uh, attributes. Uh, you could just match all nodes. Uh, match R, parenthesis, parenthesis, would just bring back all the nodes in the graph. Um, and so these match statements are, they're actually fairly powerful. And so um, what that means is that when we do creates, um, we can actually use that pattern and just create a room with the properties we want. So we don't have to do create and then set, we can just create and then um, just set our curly brace attributes. Now this, this to me, this looks kind of like JSON or a JavaScript object that has a JavaScript sort of feel to it. Um, but this is another syntax you can use when you're working with nodes. So, and I, I use a little bit of both, but I didn't want to start this out early because I felt that was a little more confusing. So, cool. Creating monsters is actually uh, very similar, right? Uh, we're just going to create monsters the same way we created rooms with just different, different properties. And the same thing for creating treasure. If we're going to create a treasure, it's got an ID, it's got a name, it's got a gold piece value. And um, it's going to do what it does. All right, just create them just like we did for uh, the rooms. It's, it's no different. So this is what our database looks like so far. We've got a rooms table with three uh, three rooms. We have a treasure table with two treasure items. We have a monster table with two pieces, two monsters. Alice the elf and Bob the ogre. Uh, I personally want the plus one sword because it's going to make me more capable as a fighter, and uh, it's worth more. But I'll take the coins if I can get them. Uh, this is what our graph looks like so far. We've got a bunch of nodes, but they're all isolated, right? They're not connected to anyone. And so right now, a relational database versus a graph database, isn't. there's there's not really a lot of benefit to one versus the other, other than that the graph database is a little more um, it's schema-less, which depending on what you're doing, it may be a pro or a con, right? But uh, let's take a look at uh, putting a monster in a room. Okay, so we, you know, monsters are, are in rooms waiting for adventurers to show up to be slain so that their gold may be uh, brought forth. And so if we have a relational database, what do we have to do here? Well, we're going to have to alter the monster table and provide some sort of default value for room ID. And then we're going to do inserts uh, or updates to the monsters and set their room ID to uh, the foreign key, room ID to that key in the uh, rooms. And now the monster is in a room. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uh, this is how we uh, put a monster in a room. And it is um, going to be the same for treasure, of course. If we have um, a graph database to put a monster in the room, we don't have to alter anything. All we have to do is create a relationship. And we can do that by matching the room. And you see here I'm using that curly brace syntax. Match a room with an ID of one and match a monster with an ID of four and using R and M as our variables. Then in our create command, we can create a relationship of type contains and use that R and the M reference those and create the relationship between those two nodes. So this then creates a relationship between uh, the room and the monster. Um, 
You just go query the two things. You go match the two things and create that relationship between them. You could actually uh, create both relationships at the same time if you wanted. You could uh, have the M on the other side. So right, right here, we've got uh, R. We could put a, a relationship going to the left and put M there as well and have, uh, have them you know, contain each other, I suppose. And not that that really makes any sense. Uh, it might make more sense for rooms. Um, but you, you could do that. So this create can actually be more elaborate than just connecting two nodes. You can create elaborate paths uh, with these statements. Uh, there's a caveat here, which uh, when you first start getting started in graph, uh, I ran into this problem, is when you go to do create, you're like, well, I want to create a room that has this ID. And, and if, you, if one exists that perfectly matches, I believe it will not create it. But that doesn't usually happen, and you don't know. So if you do this statement right here, uh, these will create duplicate rooms and monsters with the same IDs, but uh, no names. And then create a new contains relationship between them. So you, you don't want to do create for everything. Now, if you're just, you don't have a room and you don't have a monster and you don't have a relationship, you can just call create and create one long thing. Uh, but if you they exist already, you'll, you'll create a second one uh, of each of the things you're relating. So uh, the previous syntax is safer if you have existing nodes. And oftentimes you do you know, have existing nodes. So I'd say that's the rule, not the exception. Putting treasure in a room, again, is the same uh, process where we create a foreign key and populate it. And of course, putting treasure in a room works exactly the same way. Uh, we're creating a relationship between the room and the treasure. So it's just like with the monster. And so now here's our relational database. It's a little more complicated. Uh, the rooms have a one-to-many relationship with treasures, and rooms have a one-to-many relationship with monsters. So we, we've built these databases before. Uh, here's our graph so far. We now have uh, rooms that are still, we still have isolated sections of the graph, but each room now has whatever it contains. So room one contains, uh, the statue room contains Alice the elf. And um, uh, room two, the barracks, has a plus one sword. It's barracks, right? It makes sense that there'd be weapons there. And the armory um, contains both uh, a, big, a pile of coins and Bob the ogre. Uh, but our rooms aren't connected yet. Now, we'd like to do that. But with what we have already, we can already start doing some interesting queries. We can do some munchkinning and find, for example, uh, the rooms that have the most powerful monster or find the room that has the most powerful gold so that we can know that that's where we want to go. So we can, we can select this and say, give me an ordered list of rooms so that I know that I'm going to go here to get the most XP and then here to get the next most and the next most so I can optimize, so I can munchkin my game and really uh, level up my character. And the same thing for if I, I just want to be greedy and, and get treasure, I can get a, a prioritized list of treasure items and what room they're in. And so uh, let's look at what some of those queries might look like. If we want to farm all the XP uh, using a relational database, um, we just uh, do a join, right? We select um, the room and the, mo uh, the monster, uh, the monster's XP specifically. Uh, from the rooms and the monsters, uh, and then we join it on the ID, the room ID that's in monster on that foreign key. <clears throat> and then we order it descending so that the biggest room comes up first. And so this gives us the room that has, as Brad put it, the jeweled eyes um, that re uh, release the super powerful big bad boss that uh, you don't want to fight. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, this, is, this is how you would do that with a SQL database. With Graph... Uh, we've got uh, these rooms that contain monsters. And uh, it's actually kind of similar. We want to match rooms that contain monsters. And so we have this room node and the contains relationship with the directionality and then the monsters. And then we can return the individual attributes on those, uh, r.id, r.name, and m.xp. We can actually return r and m as well if we just want the nodes themselves. Uh, and then we can order them by the experience points and then uh, des descending again. So this is actually fairly similar to the uh, SQL statement, but you're you're looking for that relationship between them. And if you have a room that has a uh, uh, multiple monsters, this will bring back the room multiple times. So if you got a room with two monsters, you get the room and the monster and the room and the other monster. Uh, but it, it'll still work, and it'll still give us that prior to prioritized list of uh, monster XP. So, any questions so far? Uh, getting all the gold, 
is a similar process. Uh, we can get the rooms, we can get the treasures, do the join in SQL. This is just like we did with uh, monsters, right? The treasure and the monster are really the same problem. And when we go to do it with graph, it's the same thing. We've just swapped out monster, uh, treasure for monster. So that's good, but all we're really doing is looking through a, a list of monsters. We're really just doing joins, right? Uh, we're looking we're looking through a list of rooms and finding the things that are in them and prioritizing off the thing we want to find and giving us a sorted list. We're not figuring out how to get around in the dungeon. How do we connect the rooms so that we can figure out the paths we want to take? And this is the thing that graph databases excel at is finding paths within the uh, within the graph, and that are, it is very hard to do with SQL. And um, so let's look at connecting the rooms up. We need to connect these rooms so we can start doing these queries. Now, if we want to connect the rooms uh, with a relational database, uh, some of you probably have a good idea what this looks like already, right? You're going to create a connections table, and it's going to have the rooms that are connected to other rooms. And so uh, it's going to create this room uh, is connected, has a connection that goes from this room and to this other room. And so we need to create a table with those two IDs in it, and then we need to start populating it. And so this basically means that the rooms have a excuse me, a many-to-many -many relationship to each other. And many-to-many's are always, always means you have an intermediate table, uh, which is our connections table. Now, normally when you have many-to-many, -many, it's like the room can have many monsters and the monster can have many, many rooms, for example, and then you just have a, a, an intermediate table. But because it's rooms to rooms, we have this self-referential table, um, which, which totally works. Um, you can represent the data this way and, and it works. And it's, it's a valid way to solve the problem. Querying it uh, to find paths is very difficult. In graph, uh, connecting the rooms isn't any different than connecting anything else. We match the two things that we want to connect, and then we create um, the relationship between each other. So here we've matched room one and room two, assigned them to R1, assigned it to R2, and then we create that leads to relationship between them with a create command. And so the relationship between two rooms is no different than the relationship between a room and a monster or a room and the treasure. It's, it's just another relationship. It's just another connection. It's just another uh, edge in the graph. And uh, this means that um, you can connect these things up lots of crazy ways. You can do it any way you want to have the rooms go any way you want. You can have them refer to themselves. Um, and like you may, you may have noticed in our graph, uh, the room contains a monster and the room contains a treasure. Um, if you were doing that, you know, they're, they're both contains relationships, but that's okay because the concept of contains makes sense, right? Um, but it's all just relationships. It's just nodes and relationships. It's all a graph database is. So this is what our relational database looks like now that we've made these changes. Uh, it's gotten a little more complicated. Here's what our graph database looks like. Look familiar? This is our dungeon uh, graph from earlier. Uh, room one leads to itself. Um, actually, we, you know, room one's got a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It has a degree of seven. It's it's much more uh, degreeful than it was before, isn't it? Um, and um, yeah, this is what our graph database looks like. It it, it actually kind of looks like the dungeon. You can look at it and understand it as a as a human. It's intuitive. So now that we have a fully populated graph database, we're going to do some pathing stuff. And I'm not going to show you how to do this with SQL because, quite frankly, it's a little bit of a pain in the butt ski. And, um, and, I, and I, I really, the, the, the sole reason I would show it to you would be to show you just how hard it is in comparison. But I think if you've done any database work, you can see how sort of recursive SQL statements are just intrinsically hard. Uh, so, um, but it's super much in time. We're going to uh, come up with queries that find the best path to get the gold, to get the monsters, paths from where you are to, you know, the, the biggest treasure in the room, that sort of stuff. And we're going to do that using uh, variable length relationships. So this is a new aspect to the cipher queries that I haven't talked about yet. Uh, these two guys, uh, R1 and R2, both uh, represent the nodes just like they always have. But uh, the relationship where we're matching has this star in it, this asterisk. And um, that says, go ahead and hop several times if you need to to get where you're going. Using the leads to relationship, 
go from room to room to room to room and match all the paths. You know, match from this room to all the other rooms in the graph and from every room to every room. And what's the path? What are all the paths that you can take to do that? And um, that's what leads, that's what the star does. It says, do them all. Select multiple paths through the graph. And you can also uh, specify um, a minimum, a number, a maximum number of hops. And so one is the default if you don't, don't specify it. But for example, this will say, find all the rooms from room one that leads to another room that are between one and three hops away. So find me all those paths that are within three hops. You can replace that one with a two and then it would be things that are two or three hops away. You can put whatever numbers you want in there. And so uh, you can find things that are nearby. And which is what we're gonna do next, nearby rooms. So if we wanna find uh, all the rooms that are nearby, we would do a simple match. And we're, we're presuming here that we're in room one. So uh, room ID one, match that, that leads to one to three hops away, another room. This will give us, uh, and get a list of all the rooms that are uh, uh, one, two or three hops away. And that's what it does. Uh, I think this is kind of neat. Um, it, it's, it's a, you know, find things around me. Uh, you can see how this might be useful in like a, if you're doing like social media, uh, you could do queries like this, find the friends of my friends. Maybe they're my friends too. Find the people that are not within one hop of me, but are two hops from me. That'd be friends of my friends, but not people that I'm already friends with. Uh, you can find the nearby rooms with the most gold. Um, using um, a similar query. Say, uh, all I've done is tacked a, for the, the destination room, uh, that it uh, contains treasure. And then I return uh, the ID and the name of the room that it's uh, all those destination rooms and the gold piece value. And then we can order it by the gold piece and get a list of um, you know, most valuable rooms near me. And then if we limit to one, we'll get the most valuable room that's in, within three hops. And so we're able to, uh, you know, query this in, in quite interesting ways. Yeah. I'm in this room right now. Where's the next place I should go that has the most treasure? This, this answers that question. And uh, you might be a completionist. You might want to find the longest path through the dungeon. You, you might want to find, uh, you know, you find that you want to hit every room, explore it, check it off your checklist, kill the monster, get the gold for the entire dungeon. You want to get every single room. Well, uh, that would be the longest path through the dungeon. And so you can say, uh, uh, return a match where it says colon leads to, uh, you know, the same room leads to room with the star. But here we're saying P equals in our match statement. And that P equals um, takes that path, all the paths that we have, and um, assigns it that, to a variable P. So the path itself that we've taken can be assigned to a variable. And then we can return the nodes in that path by calling a nodes function. We can return the length of that path calling uh, a length function. And um, then we can order by that length descending and get the top one on the list. And so this gets us the longest path in the dungeon. Now, uh, it's arguable that the longest path is technically infinite because you, you would have circular stuff going on in there. But the, the graph database takes care of that. That's, that's not an issue. Um, it will find the longest path that's not uh, recurrent. So um, this is kind of a neat query. Right? Do that with your uh, do that with a relational database. I, I double dog dare you. I triple dog dare you. It's triple dog, right? I need to do a Santa Claus themed uh, talk sometime, or a, a Christmas story themed talk. And we can find the room with the biggest treasure using the width. And I think the width is uh, kind of interesting. It's it's another uh, command we can add to our cipher query where we can sort of create a, a variable as the result of a match. So here we're matching uh, max treasure, uh, you know, uh, matching all the treasures in the in the graph, assigning them to the variable max, and then the width, and then we call a function max on that gold piece value. And then we assign that to a variable. And now that variable max GP is available in subsequent matches. And so uh, we can, in the next match, match rooms that contain treasure where the gold piece value is equal to that max gold piece value. 
Now this query has a flaw because if there are two rooms that have that same max value, it's going to return them both. But you know, I, I view that as just it's nice to have options. <laughs> it's not going to return the room with the biggest treasure. It's going to return the rooms with the biggest room or rooms with the biggest treasure if they're equal. Uh, and then we just run the name and, and the name of the treasure and the gold piece value. And the path to the gold. This one's a, a bit of a piece of work. Um, it, it's a long, a long query, but here we're doing that max treasure check again, uh, match. And then we're feeding that into another match that has a width that says uh, find the rooms that contain the treasure and then uh, get the ID of that room and make that the destination. So now we have a max GP, which is whatever the maximum treasure item is. We've got the max, um, we've got the destination of the room that contains it. And now we can do a path match that says uh, from the start room, which we're assuming is going to be one, uh, how many steps, however many lead to hops you need, to the stop room, where the start room is ID of one, this is presumably the room we're in, and the stop uh, room is uh, equal to the destination ID then, which is the room that has the most treasure. And then we can get uh, the nodes and the path, uh, the length, and spit out a path, the shortest path, that will take us to uh, the room with the most treasure. Uh, and we, we, it's shortest because we do ascending instead of descending and then a limit of one. So we're, we're sorting by the length again. So we can find the path to the most gold. So. Um, I promise this isn't theory, and I actually have a demo prepared. So is everyone ready to see the demo? I, I hope so, because <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> so uh, I have created, uh, I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit. And I've got some queries here prepackaged, ready to go, just in case I get stuck. Uh, and quite um, shortest path to the most gold is, quite frankly, kind of long. Uh, it's all the way over here on line uh, 280. So I'm probably going to copy and paste that just because I don't feel like typing it. Uh, but what I'm going to do first is, so I've got Redis Enterprise set up in the cloud. Um, I've got a cloud instance of graph, uh, Redis Graph running on it. And so I'm going to hit that one. Uh, I didn't have to worry about conference Wi-Fi because I'm from home. And I can, if my Wi-Fi goes out, then I've got bigger problems. <laughs> one advantage of remote conferences is you're guaranteed your Wi-Fi works or you're not giving the talk. Um, but I have built a, a dungeon, a monster generator, a dungeon generator. And I'm going to make sure that I've got my environment set first. Did I just uh, type something I didn't want to type? Yep. So I've got a, a slash um, source dot slash environment. That's going to set some environment variables with my password because I don't want all y'all to see it. Uh, and then uh, I've got wrote this little program in JavaScript called um, Dungeon, and it generates a random dungeon with random names and random room names and everything. So it's, it's actually kind of fun. And this is all out in GitHub, so please go check it out. Uh, and I'm just going to npm start it. And it, it actually runs pretty quick. Um, yeah, a couple seconds. We've got a newly generated dungeon with 20-ish rooms. And then I'm going to uh, launch Redis CLI. And again, I, I have a little shell script to do that for me because it hides my password. And uh, if we go in here and type keys, star, we can see that I've got a, a one key. By the way, never use keys, use scan. Uh, name dungeon. And if I ask for info on dungeon, uh, it doesn't give me any info. That's fine. And um, so I can query this dungeon from Redis Graph saying graph.query and then the key name and then in quotes my graph query. So if I want to, for example, just select all the nodes, match n, return n, that will return all, match all nodes regardless of label and return them. And so uh, executed in about a quarter of a second. And it looks like we've got 74 nodes all together. Um, and I've got a couple extra nodes in here that, that aren't in my, in my sample. Uh, the uh, I added a dungeon node, and then the dungeon has has entrance and has exit, so that you can uh, say find a path that gets me through the dungeon from the entrance to an exit. So, but let's take a look at um, let's let's take a look. Look at the, one of the fun things I put in this little generator is that it generates random names. And I use this random name plugin from NPN. And then I use them to generate um, random magic item names and stuff like that. Like right here, you can see the axe of uh, however you pronounce that name. Sab Pellid. Sab Pellid? Sab Pellid, I guess that is. So let's find out what our dungeon is. Uh, 
So we're going to say ref.query match a D dungeon. So it has a label of dungeon. Return D dot name. The fabled keep of Jay Grindrill. Jay Grindrill? That sounds like a, uh, a worthy Dungeons and Dragons thing. And just to prove that uh, this uh, is actually generated, I'm going to generate another dungeon. <laughs> I don't want anyone to accuse me of cheating here. Um, yeah, I'm not upgrading NPM right now. Thank you. Um, launch the CLI. Run my dungeon name query again. And then we, now we have the Lonely Delve of Jossa left. So it's, it's generating new things each time. We can, uh, we can go out and query all the rooms. We can, like get the names of the rooms. R colon room, return r.name. And we've got 21 rooms and here's the names. Uh, the Shattered Chasm, the Grand Warren, the Dank Den. Yeah, that sounds like something. Uh, the Blue Defile, right? And uh, we can do that for uh, all of our um, Uh, treasure, and I'm not going to rename the variable here. Uh, all of our treasure, we got uh, 59 semi-precious stones, a pile of coins, a plus one mace, a chest of coins, a broken longbow. Those are our treasures. Uh, we got some monsters, and um, we got uh, seven bugbears, Mudo, the bugbear, uh, Jurel, the purple ooze, and so just having fun with it, right? And I just got arrays of, you know, different random monsters and stuff uh, generating these, but it was fun, right? Um, and actually, uh, let's let's take a look at the treasure and see. Uh, oh, there we go. And we can see how much each item's worth. So that broken longbow apparently is worth 1,400 gold pieces. <laughs> that sounds legit. Um, fun. So... You know, we've got a little graph here. I, I'm, I'm querying it for, for interesting things, but uh, let's do uh, something that returns something with a relationship. So look for, let's look for the, all the rooms that contain the treasures we care about. And one thing that I did here uh, that I didn't do in my samples is, is that the rooms can have multiple treasures and the rooms have can have multiple monsters. So, oops. And this has got to be graph.query because that's the Redis command. And then dungeon, because that's the key. And then quote. Lag. There we go. Oh, and it's miss missing the match keyword. I didn't copy match. So this returns, um, I mean, let me embiggen this a bit for y'all. There you go all the rooms and all their treasure. In fact, I probably should uh, return uh, the rooms ID as well. Um, I can use the ID command. I didn't put ID properties in here, but right, so room number eight is the dank den and room number eight is the dank den. And uh, it so it has two treasure items, right? Right here, we've got a um, plus one mace and um, four gems. So the dank den might be a place to go, right? Um, <clears throat> let's find the longest path. So I've shown you how to do this already, but I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste this in here. So graph.query dungeon quote, paste quote. So we're matching a path. The dungeon has an entrance to a room that leads to n number of rooms that has an exit to the dungeon. And we're going to turn the nodes, the relationships, and the length, and order uh, as L, and then order by L descending to find the one. And it ran that query in a little over a second, and we got um, 20. Here's our path. Here are, here are our rooms. This zero is the, the dungeon. So these are the rooms we would go through. These are the relationships between those rooms. And then uh, the path is 20. So this is the longest path. And then uh, let's do the really, really big one, uh, match uh, the shortest path to the most gold. And graph.query dungeon. And so this is the same query I showed earlier in the slides where we're matching max treasure. 
uh, and assigning it to max S XP. And then we're matching rooms that contain treasure, where the gold piece is equal to the max XP, and returning the ID as the destination ID. And then we're um, matching P the start room, leads to a stop room. And I'm hard coding a one here, because I know one is the, I know that the program works by creating a, a dungeon, which is zero. And then the next node is the first room. And so that's always going to be have an ID of one. So this works. Um, this is a similar idea. So the path to the room with the most gold uh, is uh, in room 14. And it's got a, a three hops uh, from uh, the first room. So um, that's the path we would need to take to find uh, the most gold. Uh, that's room 14. We could actually uh, find out what is the treasure in room 14. Um, graph dot query dungeon, and we want to say match t our room room that proof that I can actually type these things contains <laughs> um, a treasure t. Um, where uh, T, uh, the ID of T, or the ID of, of the room is equals 14. Return R dot ID, R dot name, T dot name, T dot GP. And I did that wrong because I didn't close it with a quote. And so it's the blue defile, which has a chest with uh, coins and gems worth 2,000 gold pieces. Um, and yeah, and that's what it is. It looks like um, actually the blue defile has multiple treasure items. So it's even even better room. It's got three treasure items. So um, cool. So that's the little demo there. Um, let me head back to my slides here. So uh, this has been sort of a fun and ridiculous application. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to throw them at me. We have about three minutes. Uh, some practical applications, uh, social networking. Social networking is a natural graph. Uh, it's people and relationships. People are nodes. The relationships are uh, the relationships. Genealogy, people are, again, the nodes. The relationships are who married whom, who, uh, who begat whom, that sort of thing. Uh, transportation networks are a really good use for graph because you can find shortest paths through a transportation network. How do we get from, yeah, you could do Kevin Bacon. Yes, you could totally do Kevin Bacon, Marty. Um, um, but transportation networks, you know, roads are intrinsic to that, but so are bus stops. And so you could find the shortest path um, in, in, on, on a map. Uh, and logistics is an interesting problem because you can uh, treat nodes as like trucks and farms and stores and warehouses and factories and keep track of um, the, the, you could actually do queries to say, where did, uh, what farm did all the broccoli that has E. coli in this store come from, right? And, or you could say, you know, you could track that sort of stuff back. And, and you can actually use it for epidemiology as well to find, you know, who's like contact tracing, it's natural graph applications. Uh, thank, thank you, Tina. That's fantastic. I, I, uh, I hope everyone got value out of it. Here's some resources. Uh, obviously, if you're going to use Redis Graph, then you need Redis. And I just use the Docker image because, uh, frankly, that's easier. Uh, or I just use it in the cloud. Uh, the Cypher query language, like I mentioned, was created by Neo4j. Neo4j has got a, a great graph database as well. Uh, theirs is a little more capable, um, but Redis Graph is faster. So that's the trade off. Um, and uh, so go check out the, the language detail there. They released it as open cipher, and so you can get the specs here. And uh, here's a blog post I wrote on Redis Graph. Um, of course, I want to encourage everyone to join our Redis Discord server, uh, because that's where I uh, hang out all the time. And if you have questions about Graph, you can always ask them there. Um, so, uh, and I, I like that the GM Kachu uh, kind of has a, sounds like your dungeon master sneezing, uh, as sort of the server URL. Uh, we have got community forums as well, and and if you want to try out Graph and don't want to do Docker, you can uh, use the Redis Enterprise Cloud. Uh, uh, there's a free Essentials version, which is what I'm using. Um, and um, this little QR code will take you to uh, this URL, which has my slides and the code and all the stuff. So, um, th uh, thank you, Tina, for the kind words, uh, Megan. Um, 
Uh, you could find us some of those completed required training when when there are weird. Yeah, yeah, you could do that too. The tech trees, that kind of stuff. I actually think you could use graphs for any database. Really, I mean, it's it's a very intuitive way of doing it. I feel like it's around nouns in the way that object oriented programming is around nouns. So um, that's sort of my. I, I like graph databases. I think they're really cool and they're interesting and uh, they scratch that little presentation, a little uh, perfectionist itch that's in all of us developers. So um, any further questions we got? I guess one, making time for maybe one. Um, thank you all, thank you all very much. It was good seeing everyone virtually as well. Um, I'll probably try and hang out in the networking thing a lot later on. So if you have any questions, uh, bug me there and, I'll, and hit me up on chat. Um, so yeah. Thanks a lot for uh, coming to my talk, and I, I hope you learned something. Uh, I, got, I got one slide left. Oh yeah, my name's Guy Rice. Please follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, you all have a good day too.